Andrea Intergal Robinson. Uh, be speaking to us on chief based modeling of wireless communications. And uh, so, uh, kind of, of of doing theoretical stuff uh, that uh, let's do in applied topology uh, and kind of on the chief theoretic end of things. Uh, and he also uh, goes further in the other direction that I think most of us go in that he actually implements some of his ideas in, in actual hardware, so real devices. To do things. Uh, so, uh, my great pleasure to introduce Michael. Uh, thanks. All right. Well, thanks, Peter, uh, for the invitation for this. This is uh, an opportunity to talk, and uh, I think there's a good forum for talking about these kind of ideas, especially since uh, many of us find uh, it difficult to squeeze things into our schedule. I know I do. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, wireless networks and wireless communications. This is a project that I have been having uh, going on for the past year or so, almost a year, I guess, I guess nine months or so. Anyway, uh, it's about modeling wireless network communications, in particular addressing the question about wireless network vulnerability. So how can I tell whether or not my network is going to work or break or go down or, or what? Um, so without further ado, let me acknowledge uh, two of my students that I've been working with, uh, Dinesh Krishnarao and Morgan Dehart. Uh, Morgan just recently graduated with his master's degree. Uh, had funding from two groups. Uh, initial funding got started from the Air Force. Uh, now this has been picked up by DARPA. And if you're interested in reading what I've written on the subject and related, you can certainly go hop over to my website. Okay, so we, the idea of this problem is we want to assess the vulnerability of an ad hoc wireless network. Uh, and we're interested in vulnerability of the network to maybe not working quite so well if the network gets congested. Um, or if there's some kind of link failure, you know, a piece of equipment going on, or even something adversarial, if there's some jamming or something that someone's trying to bring down your wireless network. Um, so this is this is a, a, a double problem in communications, um, and there, there are a number of challenges. Uh, first of all, the physical layer, it, the physical is is extremely variable. It's some aspects of the the wireless problem are that if you move around, uh, your power level may change abruptly, your bit error rates may change abruptly, uh, your link quality may change due to other users. So it, just the physics is kind of hard. Uh, and then the other problem is that, hey, network connectivity can be kind of complicated. Uh, you know, a wired network, well, it's pretty easy. I know the two nodes in my network are connected, if there's a uh, if wireless network, no, well, that's not quite so obvious. Um, and it's actually kind of hard to measure the connectivity of wireless network in practice. When you sit down with someone who does this sort of thing for a living, uh, they give you various metrics for being able to measure how whether or not a link is is made or not, but it's it's kind of fuzzy. Um, the problem is is that on the access, which is telling you whether or not you're whether or not you're able to talk on the network at the present moment, is not necessarily easy to do either. Uh, if you've had a wired network, again, that's not so bad. Um, you can see any other guy talking or not. And that's the story. Uh, with a wireless network, you have to listen and you have to make decisions. Um, this really can impact the performance of the network. What I suggest, and where I think that the applied topology point of view can be very helpful, is to take a more abstract methodology. Rather than committing a high fidelity to a high fidelity model, uh, which is the way the, the engineering community tends to address ad hoc wireless networks, is to say, let's, let's say I'm talking about an 802.11g network, and this is what its physical layer, layout looks like, and this is the kind of traffic the nodes want to pass. Uh, this is the kind of application layer, rather than trying to commit to that. Uh, let, let's back off from that a bit. Let's say instead we want an abstract model. Uh, all I know is some kind of local connectivity that, that is necessarily very highly refined, uh, but still somewhat easy to measure. Uh, so maybe, and in fact, I won't necessarily commit to specific decisions. So rather than a network is connected at this point to these nodes, um, I may, this is the collection of nodes that I would believe might be connected here. And what's the benefit of topology is that it starts to say, if I have some local connectivity information, 
start making some global inferences about the overall network health. So in particular, just looking at the connectivity alone is already kind of enlightening. And then connectivity understood, I start building together some global model says this is kind of the way the network is hooked together. But of course, with the caveat that this is abstract in some sense, then you can start to add more detail, more protocols, more real physical layer models, more realistic application layers to say, this is what I'm trying to do with this network. Uh, and you can add that in sort of hierarchical fashion. I'll just give you a feeling for how that goes in this talk. So challenge that I just, just threw down. So first of all, uh, to try to address the terms about the physical layer and the media access at the same point. Uh, so rather than specifying a single detailed model, let's use a family of models. And rather than having very detailed, complex models, let's use a bunch of simple models and ask how do they fit together? Well, the other issue could be that the network is, connectivity is complicated. Well, I think the problem with this is thinking about networks from a graph theoretic standpoint. It works great for wired networks. These wired networks use wires, after all, and they're kind of one-dimensional. Uh, if you're dealing with a wireless network, it's be one-dimensional because, well, pro propagation happens in three dimensions. So we should higher dimensional. And if it's simple, let's use a simplicial complex. The problem is, well, connectivity is hard to measure in practice. I can necessarily tell you whether or not nodes are connected or not, except by listening to traffic. Um, that's really the only way I can tell is if there is a connection is to actually sound that out. So let's try to use a family of simplicial complex models to let me loosen up on the ability to nail down to one specific network. Saying one specific, this is the connectivity which you can, of course, do wired network. Uh, let's just have a parturized family. We're going to think in the back of our minds that maybe one of them is right. Maybe none of them are right. Maybe, maybe the connectivity is somewhere in the structure. And the media access question a little more carefully. Uh, use some sheaf theory to try to give you an expressive model that manages media access and then to start to tell you how you can splice protocols into that as well. So we go off with a very abstract model that's simplistic. In fact, to, to some who's comfortable with wireless ad hoc networks might say this misses out on the important detail, but what it provides is it provides a skeleton, an undergirding for building up a much more accurate and much more high fidelity model the way that you can gracefully sell that. So the first thing is explain the simplicial complex that I use to model a network. And I have two such models in my mind. Uh, first of all, I need to get something out of the way. Topology engineer is not topology to a mathematician. It means something different. Uh, the topology of a wired network uh, to, a, to an engineer, that means, well, how did I hook up the wired network? And so the start and end of it, it's a graph. It might be direct, but it's a graph. Uh, vertices represent nodes. The edges represent actual wires between the nodes, like I read cable from one node to another. Um, but it is that really that, from a topological, like mathematician topological point of view, uh, the topology of wired networks is not always very interesting. In fact, it can be like star networks, which are contractible, and that kind of gets people bored. Um, so in a sense, topology isn't quite the right word for wired networks in some sense from a mathematician topology standpoint. But from wireless networks, already you need to be in a more abstract setting. It's just vertices to represent nodes. But now I have not just edges, but higher dimensional faces also. They connections of nodes that are either co-visible to one another or, or co-interfering in some sense. To say that the nodes here, this family of nodes, if any one of them transmits, then the other one either going to hear or going to be affected in some way. So it turns out to be somewhat of a proxy for network density. If I have a really dense network, lots of nodes, and they can all hear each other, you can end up with a very high dimensional complex. On the other side, I have a very sparse network where very few of them can hear each other, then I end up with something that's a bit lower dimension. That's what might work. So here's our list network with four nodes, four vertices. 
Uh, each vertex is an actual individual node. Now, is I might say that you know there there's some pairwise connections. These pairs of nodes can communicate. So one and V2 can communicate. V3 can communicate, but V2 and V4 cannot. Um, and again, I'm making somewhat of a simplifying assumption here, and we're going to try to parameterize over these things to avoid that simplicity. Okay, but now this is a wireless network, so maybe V1, V2, and V3 can all talk, or can all. Here, they might not be able to talk. The channel may not be reciprocal in some fashion, or they might mess each other up in some fashion. This model, as they can communicate, actually, that's a, what, what engineers call a reciprocal channel. Transmission and reception are, are to some extent, dual processes of one. Okay, get some terminology here. Um, a faucet of a simplicial complex is a, it's a simplex is not part of any higher dimensional simplex. Top dimensional simplex is a faucet. So that two-dimensional guy, that's a faucet, but that is there and the edges on it are not faucet. So let me put the physical model. So we're gonna admit in the background, there's something that really is like signal noise ratio, bit error rate, or any of one of the other parameters that engineers like to use to characterize how well their networks are working. I don't, play I don't, I don't really rely on them if I don't have to. So for the pieces here, let, let, let's just come up with a, a very basic model. So for each node, I'm going to assign a, a, to it a, an open covered region in the environment, maybe a two-dimensional environment or something like that. Uh, that's telling you physically, this is as far as that node is, their transmissions are going to reach. Uh, they might not necessarily be heard and understood, but they reach into that area. So they might, in fact, Near the be kind of interference rather than actual transmissions, but they have some effect over that region. I'm giving you a signal strength function representing that maybe a probability of reception with no interference or something like that. Um, we we'll practice it may not be particularly continuous. It may be kind of continuous or or worse. Uh, that really doesn't end up bothering us too much here. Okay with this. Well, the easiest thing you can do is ask, well, whether or not can two nodes, can they communicate? Well, that means that uh, I have two nodes if their signal strengths are large enough so that if I have node I, maybe red one there, uh, that signal strength is large enough that it reaches all the way to node J. And so left, we have the, the green node. That green node can, can transmit and the red node will hear it, but not vice versa. The red node can transmit but the green node won't necessarily hear it. On the right side, um, they can mutually communicate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down all these vertices, and then I'm going to start putting in edges. Put in edges whether, whether the pair of nodes can communicate. So I'm building a flag complex over all these various edges. What about the link complex? Very small object, study from a mathematical standpoint. Um, but it turns out it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good structure to study study. Something a little different. Um, wire networks are sometimes configured so that rather than nodes communicating directly, nodes are communicating with mobiles. Uh, so for instance, this is the sort of situation where your wireless nodes are cell phone transmission towers or something like that. In certain settings, these, these are actually mobile. Um, and the question is, they may have a bunch of other Devices talk to them, but don't talk to any other devices. The cell phone tends to work like this. It talks to the base station, the base station talks to it, but your cell phone doesn't talk directly to any other cell phone. So in this case here, what you really are asking is, when, when I'm in a situation where I'm going to interfere with uh, that are connected to another base station, if I have a base station that's transmitting, when is it going to mess up the nodes that are working with another base station? So when, when do two nodes interfere? It's kind of like the opposite idea. So for instance, uh, this barely is like the check complex. When are these coverage regions going to intersect to a certain level of signal strength? So sort of dual to the one we just had a, a, a while ago, uh, the, those two coverage regions intersect, uh, even though the green node cannot hear the red node's transmissions, the red node can mess up and can interfere with any that are trying to communicate with the green node. Oh, that says the fact that that interference can happen, that pastes in an edge. 
other hand, if those two coverage regions are not intersecting at all, uh, the two stations can operate without interfering with either of their mobile nodes trying to connect to it, and we're not going to put it in edge. So this is, as I said, kind of like the check complex. So we have the link complex and we have the interference complex, which are like, um, which are like the, the which are fact flag complex and a check complex. These are two useful ways to think about networks from a simplistic complex standpoint. Of course, complexes aren't that interesting, so we need to do some analysis. So thing that you can do is just do it intuitively and say, well, what does this mean? Well, the interference complex in particular, which is a little more subtle, uh, it's, it's useful to represent these base stations or access points in which the network is perhaps not so ad hoc. Um, but what a simplex does, or in particular, what, what a simplex says is it says the base, these base stations can interfere with each other. Uh, maybe not directly with their, their own transmissions, but with other stations trying to communicate with them. And what a faucet is, that's a top dimensional simplex, that's a maximal collection of mutually interfering nodes. And again, they may not even know for listening to the listening to the airways that they're interfering, but they interfere with each other's transmissions. Uh, the bushel complexes are, are not the same. This should come as no surprise to anyone who's played around with uh, flat complexes or jack complexes. Here's a quick example. So I have three sub base stations. Uh, the link complex and the interference complex are shown there. Uh, no one and node two, for instance, cannot communicate because, in particular, although their coverage regions intersect, uh, coverage regions do not include the base stations in question. Um, on the other hand, they can, everyone can interfere with everyone else. They're, the interference complex is much more highly connected. Uh, in particular, it's witnessed by the fact that there is a point in that three way intersection. Uh, there really is a place where all three nodes can interfere with one. Pass of what we can do from an analytical standpoint. What do? Well, I can certainly take homology of those, those wireless networks complexes, and it tells us something about the network, but it doesn't tell a lot. Uh, it, what you know can be summarized by this the very simple slogan that says non trivial, high degree homology classes mean the network is thin in some sense. The traffic may get confined to some kind of end of the network in some fashion. So, in particular, if I have a high degree one degree is this plot here. On the left, a non-trivial first homology class. Uh, if I would travel from one side of the network to the other, transmit data from one side of the network to the other, I, I have to go around the network. So in the other case, I can make a few hops through the network. Um, and that really isn't very enlightening, but it tells us a little bit about the overall global structure of the network. And what I'd like to do is start to drill down and come up with some more refinement. Remember, I said from the outset, I'm not trying to commit to a signal strength. You will notice in the previous slides, though, that I did to a signal strength. And so now let me come good on my promise. Uh, let's try to parameterize these signal strengths. Use them as a parameter. I'll come up with a family of wireless network complexes, uh, and they fit together in a persistence way, more or less the usual way that you'd expect. So, of course, have to do obligatory persistence dire discussion. Uh, so if I have a bunch of coverage regions for these four nodes uh, diagram here, they don't intersect at all. Um, so what do I see? Well, in terms of signal level, I have four connected components, four dimension zero generators, and no dimension one generators. They have just four islands of not network nodes. Now, if I crank up the signal level, at some point, those together in that they either start to interfere with one another in this particular case so let's say that that's a interference complex they start messing with each other's base each other's mobile stations uh, so those connected components go away we've gone down from uh, three, uh, four, three connected components but no dimension one generates and then of course well a little bit more we start getting a dimension one generator and eventually it all gets glommed together okay how is it going to be useful? This is going to be useful for understanding how networks work. Let's also try to bring in here the discussion about wireless network activation. Wireless network. Tell me how how how, how am I actually using that? Because of course, part of the reason why 
homology or homology in general isn't very insightful is because the network isn't a static thing. It's not just sitting there telling me, roughly speaking, the network is thin. Well, that doesn't really tell me it may matter. In fact, I may get confined to being around the edge of the network due to what how the network's being used. So I should model that in some fashion. And the way to that is think about the kind of network access patterns that you might have. Uh, for one thing, if I have two nodes that are far apart in the network, uh, by this sense, I mean that there's no simplex connecting. What does this mean? This means that uh, that if I do this fancy carry sense, multiple access collision avoidance, that's CSMA, CA, that a standard protocol for managing the access to a wireless network. Uh, it does is it says, what I should do is I should listen. And if I'm then I make the assumption that it's safe to talk, although some feelers out that if I hear someone else talking, I'll stop. Uh, that kind of idea is really it's being uh, developing a simplistic way to think about network activation and network usage. So what possible configurations of simultaneously transmitting nodes are available, and how does that impact the behavior of the network? First is question. What overall communication are possible, given very local constraints? All I'm doing is node by node doing this listening, and if I have something to say, trying to talk. Now, played around with the mathematics of sheaves, knows that sheaves are local objects, they represent local information. Um, so, in fact, you can encode this local media access protocol in a sheaf, and I'll show you how. Let's go back to the small model. Okay, simplicial complex model, and I, what I'm going to start doing is giving data, labeling it. Start off by telling you what a sheaf is generally, and then make it specific to the wireless access situation. So here we've got our graph, we've got our bushel complex, we've got structures. So what do we do? Well, one thing to think about is we think about it as a topological space. Another we can, way we can think about it is we think about it as a category, as a circles and arrows. Um, and so here, what I've done is I've just listed out the faces of my simplicial complex as sets. Um, as you may notice, I got a little lazy with the curly brackets. Don't let that bother you. Um, but each of these arrows here are inclusions, set inclusions. So, for instance, V1, just the vertex alone, includes into the edge connecting V1 and V2. And edge includes into that two simplex. Okay, so this attachment diagram tells me how these simplices are fitting together. First, what a sheaf is, I start ascribing data to that. So I link it with perhaps real numbers, perhaps other values. We're labeling it not with real numbers, but we'll end up labeling it with modified in a moment. Uh, but for the moment, this is easy enough. Start labeling each of those faces. And the data over that, this, this vector space in this case, or the set sitting over, it's called the stock over that vertex. Um, and that tells you essentially the local information that's available at each of those faces. I just had arrows there a moment, so let me bring arrows into existence. Well, some kind of maps on there for vectors is very natural to put linear maps. For sets, it would be natural to put functions. For groups, it would be natural to put homeomorphism, homomorphisms. Um, and so, of course, this is a whole category you happen to be using, and the objects morphisms out of it. Um, you're building this structure. Each of these functions is called a restriction. This is the restriction maps between the stalks. Uh, and the important property of this is, well, it's not the ecologist giving this talk, so everything had better commutes. Uh, for instance, these maps had better commutes, so that if you follow around one way around this little rectangle that I've got there by matrix multiplying, I better get the same answer when I go the other way. Okay, so that's an object I'm going to call a sheaf. Now, a sheaf is I can pull out information out of the, each of these vector spaces and do so in a way that agrees with all of these various restriction maps. So if I start, say, at the top from one, I go down, I get to zero one by matrix multiplying. If I come up the bottom, I get to that same zero one. Uh, if I do that everywhere, I call this global. Now, this is really kind of a nice structure. Uh, you can imagine that you could spend some time enumerating these sorts of things, and of course you can, uh, and to figure out all the different possible ways to assign data out of each of the stocks such that it's consistent with the restrictions, that whenever you take the data, pass it through the restriction maps, you get this already there. 
uh, Neville's section. You may not be able to do this everywhere. For instance, if I change the top one to a two, now I'm kind of in trouble. Uh, certainly move cross to zero, but if I start up from the bottom, well, uh, one is not equal to two, so I can't really fill in that middle there. Uh, I've got an X, kind of out of luck. Similarly, I can't fill in anything on the other face. And maybe I can't assign anything to the far left of the diagram. So some section sheets are just local, and you really can't even extend them any further to be a global section. You're stuck with that. Okay, telling you how to build local and local constraints. So let me tell you how to build a exit activation sheaf. The sheaf that describes our ability to talk about media access. And here's how you do it. So what I have here is I have a link complex drawn uh, for a wireless network with seven nodes. And each one of those nodes a unique ID. There are various IDs that might that you might consider, maybe MAC address, maybe other IDs that you might wish to use. Find those IDs and imagine each of those nodes with their respective IDs. Okay. Now what I do is over each face, over each over each node, etc. I'm going to start putting a subset of those labels, and that is going to tell you who's nearby. So if you sit yourself down on the far left of this diagram, uh, what we've got is we've got, well, no, node one, certainly node one is nearby itself, and is adjacent to it. On this special symbol bottom, that symbol means nothing. And so what this is saying is either node one can be node one, node two, or bottom. Well, nearby, actually, really what I mean is, I mean, who is using the channel? Who's using it right there? So in the vicinity of node one, either node one can use, use the channel, or node two can, or it might be idle. No one might be using it. Okay, let's move the rest of this diagram. So for instance, if I slide up, up to, well, node one and node two can use that channel, and of course, no one can use that channel. Uh, that could be idle. Now what about node two? What happens there? Well, what happens, node one can be can use the channel, so can node two, of course, just as before, but now nodes three and four can also use the channel uh, that is available at node two. So node two can be impacted by different sets of nodes that are used elsewhere. Okay, again, no one can, might use that, that channel. Michael? Yes. Hey, good question. Absolutely. Go hey, it's Liz. Sorry. Um, okay, so I'm a little bit confused. So what does it mean for the edge to be, does the edge represent a channel itself, or is that, my understanding of how these networks work is that you would be using either one or two. So what does it mean for the edge to be using a channel? Okay, what I'm really doing is that edge is not actually using a channel. That edge, if you will, is the channel. Um, and the nodes, too, themselves, what I'm really thinking about is I'm thinking about uh, the the portions of the open sets, these activation areas, these 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 areas that are in use by the channel. So oh. the, 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 the between one and two is in fact the channel. That's one and two. I, all and right. So, and, and that's a really good lead in to what happens next. If I take a look at the edge between two and four, they're both touching edge. But you know, three is also involved here. If node three turns on, then that channel between two and four, they have to wait until three is done. So what you end up doing, adjacency really is, in, is meant as higher dimensional face in common width, not just it's isn't in the graph theoretic sense. Uh, particular, when I'm taking a look at the data on, on this edge, well, that's telling me not just who's using the channel, and the, the, the end points of this node. It may be who's using the channel and may be affecting it due to wireless propagation from elsewhere. And in particular, what this means is then if I want to relate the information from what's going on, what is who's the channel using at, at the vicinity of node one to the link between node two and four, uh, this is now where my restriction comes in. And what I have is I have to maintain consistency. Uh, this is what the sheath is doing. It's building this consistent structure. So, I, for instance, if the channel at two is idle, then you know if I move over to the channel between two and four, the necessary condition for that to be happening is that channel two must be idle. 
So I map the bottom to bottom. Now, so two is transmitting, for instance. The link between two and four, we'll say, yeah, two is transmitting. So that's two to two, and clearly more or less the same idea, four to four, and also three to three. What is no, no one can be heard by node two. So I'm sitting there at node two, and I'm listening, and I'm hearing node one. Uh, what does that mean if no one's hearing with one another? What does that mean for the connection between two and four? Well, it's currently listening, isn't it? It's listening to one. So that means that, that really and that means that the link between two and four has to be idle in order to work. And that means that I'm going to add fact map uh, the the label one sitting over node two to the bottom label sitting over that edge. So an easy way to, to characterize this is you map by the identity whenever you can, can and you map the idle. So this you can imagine filling out the rest of this diagram. And that built this wireless activation chief. What this thing looks like. So here's a simple link complex with three nodes, one connected to the next. Right below it is the activation sheath. Uh, so I've tried to organize this so that the bottom row there is over each of the vertices, and the, the row above that is over each of the edges. And so you can see the, that the link between one and two is, gonna, is going to be connected to one and two. The link from two and three is going to be connected to two and three. Again, won't hear link uh, node one, uh, but node two for everyone. Some possible sections that you might get. You might get the section, which is on the top in blue, is node transmitting. Node transmitting, the link between one and two is in use by node one. Node two hears node one, but then link between two and three must be idle to avoid interference. And node three then, as a result, must be idle. On the other two is transmitting, then everyone hears node two. Of course, the uh, section that looks very much like no, uh, the one on the top for node three, and the section where the network is completely idle. So you can imagine all these activation patterns and tell you something useful about the structure of the network. Now, I want to enumerate all of these things. In fact, actually, that's an empty complete problem. It's been this particular, it's a sheath based encoding of a, of a known problem, and I want to be taking this somewhat in a different direction. Um, so what sections typically look like? Section activation sheets typically are built up with a whole bunch of islands of activity separated by idle, re uh, by idle areas. So I think, say the red node there is transmitting, the green node is transmitting, and then the links between them are idle to prevent interference. So this means there's a typical section that you might look at. It's kind of like a linear combination of these various activated regions. Uh, and then they're separated by islands where there's not much going on, where there's idle stuff. Uh, linear combination, of course, of quotes, because there's no linear structure. These are sets that we're talking about. But roughly speaking, this is what I want you to think about, is that there are a bunch of these different things put together. So let's sort of tear this apart. Really understand. So what you can do, imagine, is that I'm going to just focus in on one transmitting node. So for instance, this is what you might call the active region of red node with a particular section. So I have a particular section that is there, a global section, and what's happened is that those are what I've shown in red, faces of this simplicial complex uh, that have taken the, the, the label red. Okay, seems pretty simple. I could have to do this for another node, like the green node. Yeah, the transmitting, here's what its active region for a different section is. Uh, but if I run with this for just a little bit, you realize that, well, I didn't have to worry about the section, provided the node is actually on, uh, then the active region really doesn't depend on the section. It's only on the structure of, of the network. So this sheath is really identifying things that are logical in nature. It's so hard to prove that active regions are closed, connected sets, uh, and it, that ends up meaning that you've got some nice structure. The reason for them being closed is specifically to avoid interference. Okay, now, you think about this from the other way, is that if I turn on the green node, um, it's going to influence, it's going to, not only is it going to light up the active region, the portion of, of the network that hears that node, but it is saying another portion of the network because that other portion of the network is trying not to interfere with it. Um, you can imagine if you take the star over the active region, uh, take a look at all the other cells that are connected directly to the active region, that gives you a, a region of influence, the 
at which um, which that node, say the green node, for instance, there is is it turned on and, and trans maybe you can't hear it, but you still are quiet because of its presence. Um, because in if you try to talk to any of those nodes that are in the active region, they'll tell you to hold on. Uh, okay, so the active regions uh, do not these, these regions of influence do not inter intersect the active regions of any other node, which is say that that's. There are ways to keep the nodes separate, and that's what this very simplistic protocol does. Okay, of course, go the other way, take a look at the other direct of this, and you can see the same kind of thing happens for the red as well. Now, this leads to start thinking about, well, okay, if I take a look at these regions of influence as regions that are they're sort of prohibiting transmission of this region, uh, in some sense, they're really losing track of what the rest of the network is. They were built, they're really kind of local in some sense. Uh, so if I take a look at a particular faucet now, so this is a wireless resource, that two-dimensional faucet there in the middle, that's a particular wireless link that's being shared by three different transmitters, that too has a region of influence. If I light that, that particular faucet up, it bends a small portion of the network, it is an interaction with a small portion of the network. And then the rest of the network in gray there really isn't affected. Well, so that's kind of local. Uh, in some sense, really, that's, if you will, the rest of the network. So if I take a look at the, the to the region of influence, that's a closed subcomplex. Uh, and in dark black there. Hmm, okay. The rest of the network, one very reasonable thing to do is to start thinking about collapsing that. So let's take these ideas. And putting them together to do something useful with the network. So, Will, that was some theory. Now, let's talk about some practice. Um, and in particular, what I want to do is take a look at some simulated network data, and some simulated network performance, and see how these invariants are useful. Uh, so I have two invariants that, that I think are worthy. So, the first one is this persistent object invariant that I alluded to sort of the first chunk of the talk. The second one, where we were just about getting into with this local invariance. Uh, this local notion is the local view of the network where I'm going to imagine that the rest of the network is somehow not my problem. Uh, this gives me two different views into the network. The persistent one, the persistent homology one is a global invariant. Selling vulnerability to some very specific source of interference, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, and it's time independent. The other one is so, but rather than be global, it's local. The vulnerability of a particular link and tells the vulnerability of the network to a particular Link. They're, they're not completely whole story, they're not complete invariants by any means, uh, but they're a step in the right direction. So let's back to persistent homology discussion again. So here my network again. And perhaps what's happening to this network is depending on conditions, uh, it may have an increasingly large number of link failures, i.e., someone may be interfering with some portion of the network. Uh, and we don't exactly know what their interference level is. We're going to dial that up. Or maybe traffic, or maybe there's a power failure, or all manner of things that could go wrong. And we'd like to know uh, how sensitive is the global structure of the network to being brought down. So in the network, right now, there are no links. But when I link that goes down, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove its region of influence from the network. We were just talking about region of influence. That's why I'm using region of influence here because the right thing as predicated by a, a very simplistic media access protocol. So let's start taking down some portion of the network. So let's bring one link. That's the, the link between one and two. So what we're doing, we're deleting the closure, uh, the star of the closure over that link. And what happens is node one goes down, node two goes down, nodes four stay up, but the links to nodes one and two go down. Now that's bad. That, that's not really good for if you're trying to send traffic to or from node one, but the rest of the network's okay still. Aggressively more failures, now I've brought down a second link. Uh, now we're getting progressively more damage to the network. So my imagine here is that I've built a filter. Getting the of the network getting worse and worse. Uh, that, of course, leads to a filtration of sub so a filtration of interference, and it leads to a filtration of Active or still alive network subcomplexes. Of course, you get a persistence module out of that in the usual way. Um, and so, let's show you 
example. Here is an interference. Sorry, uh, Michael. Here. Yeah. What was the filtration? Uh, so the filter the filtration is tell me how many nodes are in the network are gone as I'm increasing the severity of interference. So as I end up with work that is a, a say initially very small network that's being interfered with. So you need bit. And then it gets there as I ramp up the interference. Now, what's the interested in computing the persistence of is the complement of that. Telling me the network is available as I start ramping up the interference. Question? Yep. Okay. So let me, I, I think this example will help too. So I have interference source number one and interference source number two. I'm going to run two separate tests. Where interference source number one, what it's going to do is it's going to turn on a little bit, and immediately what it's going to do is it's going to knock out a small region, um, and as the interference gets worse, it's going to end up splitting the network into two parts. Now, source number two, it was on. It's not going to split the network into two parts. It's effect is basically lost the right half of the network. As that interference gets worse, first the network will still be mostly connected. Uh, most of the left side won't even notice until eventually it really gets quite bad. Um, and what you would imagine from this, from the persistent homology standpoint, is that if you look in just the connected components, the H0, persistent H0, it'll tell you uh, just how bad, bad one is versus two, and will give you an idea that interference one is kind of somehow more catastrophic to the network because more nodes can't communicate to one another. Here's a quick persistence diagram. It's flipped around a little bit funny just due to the way that I computed this. Um, the, the radii are actually in time steps, but that this is as the time is increasing. The appearance is also increasing with that. The, the point to look at is the distance of, of that, uh, you know, take a look at the bottleneck distance of the various <clears throat> persistent uh, generators. And appearance source one, that was sitting between those two networks, the one on the right isthmus there, uh, that one's somehow worse because it's causing a significant, a significant uh, generator of H2. On the source number two, uh, lots of small generators that come and go away, but nothing really significant. So in some sense, the, the, the damage to the network done by current source one is a bit more drastic and a bit, bit more concern. It is, in some sense, more vulnerable, right? It's a narrow isthmus between the two halves of the network. Uh, worth I'll put a plug in here. This code uh, that I ran here was, was making use of Perseus uh, by Vidit Nanda, uh, which happens to be a pretty easy to interface block of code. Um, so this is something that, is, that you can think about in terms of performance on a global set. Okay, so, let's around and take a look at the local I'm just interested now in the vulnerability of a particular link rather than the vulnerability of the network at large. So we were going down the path a moment ago about talking about the rest of the network, deleting its region of influence. That's what interfering seems to mean. So the, the buzzword here is we're going to take a look at local homology. So say, for instance, I, I've got my network. Here it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus my attention on the region of influence of a particular node. Say no four here. Uh, that of influence is what I've darned for you there. And what I do is I'm going to take a look at the local homology there, which means I do what? Well, I take the rest of the network. There it is, darker. I like forget about it, or say it's all really everything else. Uh, and we, the East Coast person, I remember having seen a, a poster of a New Yorker's view of the world. This is very much the way I view this, which is that you have a picture that's very detailed of New York City. There's Boston not too far away. There you can see maybe not too far away from that is upstate. And there's California and Hawaii and whatnot. Uh, this is much the way that Node 4 sees, Node 4 sees the network as this very refined picture nearby, and outside of that refined region of influence, that's just the rest of the world. Okay, base of this. Is this particular thing, of course, has been studied by lots of people, not versus just computing local homology, but local homology turns out to be a really handy thing to use to study networks. Uh, because the excision property, this is a local invariant, um, and what it really does is it generalizes graph 
degree. Doing, in fact, if you look at it, is if you take a look at the, the first local homology class, pop on there, that's an upper bound on the number of connected components when you attack a particular link. Uh, and this upper bound can, can be obtained uh, when, when the graph is just a tree. Uh, but it works sort of like this. If I knock out this node here, or this link rather, uh, well, let's see. But if I hear now the network is disconnected, and in particular that local homology difference is something that tells me about the local, in this case it's a graph, it's generalizing graph degree in some sense. But now I can talk about it not just for vertices, I can talk about it for edges also. So, uh, handy. And you can ask, what does this mean for a network in particular? So here we work, and what I've done for you is I've colored that complex based on what the local homology dimension of H1, the local one homology is. Uh, I've got to add one to tell you the number of connected components. But this, as I said, generalizes graph degree in some sense. The, the blue guy, the zero, that's really like an endpoint sitting there. It's really like someone has come in and just connected on, it's a valence one vertex, of course, plus one is one. That one there, again, remember one, that looks kind of like a valence two vertex. And in particular, when I break the network there, uh, I end up with two components. Now, that's kind of like a valence three vertex. If I knock out that link or interfere with that link, I end up with three connected components. Uh, pretty neat. And recently, although it didn't make it into these slides, playing around with trying to infer these from data. And that's, that's kind of neat. And that kind of works. Uh, so how do I splice in data? Well, I need something a little more structured. So let me show you how that goes. So we've got sheaths. Here's a, here's a sheaf model of a queue, a deep queue. So E was R of threes are storing three little numbers. And this is through time. What do those matrices do? Hmm. All the matrices. So what they're doing is they're projecting out either the first or the last component. And twos there are showing you what information is retained from one step of the queue to the next. So it, in some sense, keep track of the evolution of this, this queue. Here's an example that might look like. So I have right in the middle there that 119 in my queue. If I go forward in time, what happens? Well, the key shifts, I put, bring in a five to the right, and I throw away the nine. If I go to the left, I throw away one of those ones, and I bring in a two. So walking through history, walking through time, what the history of this 3D queue is. What I can take my link complex, there is on the left, I've drawn it vertically, draw time, build out a complex that goes through time, uh, and start imagining that I'm labeling this graph. Now, this is, this is something that's kind of fancy, uh, and you can dig into some of the more details if you're interested. Um, but essentially, I've got is I've got a transmit queue and a receive queue, and also keep track of, in another queue, who's transmitting. That station chief is also in there. So what this is going to do is this is going to allow me to start talking about network switches and also tell me how the traffic is being managed. So if I one of those stocks and tell you what's up, well, what I've got is I've got who is transmitting before, who's transmitting now, what data is currently on the link, and what's up next for transmitting. And it even gives me a way to manage receipt transmission and whether or not the network is idle. A uh, mark in there means don't care. So I can key off of the state of the, the second tree there. Tell me I'm currently receiving, transmitting, or idle at that node. Of course, the same thing happens on the node below as well. So this is one of the restriction maps. Of course, there's, there's others. The others are how to move through time and advancing the queue or not. When I advance the queue, or when, I, when I transmit, I advance the queue. And if you look through the, the, top or the, bottom, or the top or the bottom of these entries, so the one that starts off, let me see, I've got a pointer here, don't I? So if you take a look at this right here, that one is receiving. Transmit queue doesn't get advanced there. It's idle. So again, I don't advance the queue. But right in the middle, going right here, is I'm last entry because I'm going to transmit the DN component. And I slide the queue along and pick up the next piece of information. It's worth noting there are various other ways of doing this. In fact, there are many ways for different kinds of protocols. Uh, but this gives a way to start thinking about how to flow data through your network using a sheaf to modulate that behavior. So, how do I more fi high fidelity simulation? 
Well, one might do this is start categorifying data. Looks like these can support faithful models of network behavior. That's great. Uh, you know, engineers have been doing full fidelity models for a long time. They're kind of, well, they work small. They're kind of bad and big because they're hard to simulate. And as I mentioned earlier, there are NP complete issues as well. Uh, the issue is that you're thinking about this combinatorially. If you're thinking about this algebraically, you may be able to get by with weaker invariants. As sometimes one likes to say, something or other to the rescue, in this case, categorification to the rescue. So what I'm going to do is imagine that some of this set value stuff, these labels, get lifted to vector spaces or modules or something. Uh, and everything inside is a module homomorphism. That's great. I can compute cohomology. Awesome. Uh, well, maybe so awesome because now I have these enormous vector spaces to carry around that I might not want to compute with. And I end up with states and mixed states kind of in a funny way. Pure states make sense. That's one of the nodes is definitely transmitting, or maybe file. Uh, the mixed states are kind of kind of thing. I don't know who's transmitting. Maybe node one is, maybe node two is, maybe I don't know. Uh, so interpretation is kind of tricky, and this is definitely a very open subject at the moment. Structure that's preserved. Now, with is just a, a quick touch at some of the experimental process that we've been doing. Uh, we use something called NS2. It's a network simulator. It generates high fidelity plus network traffic. Uh, as much as I'd like to go out and build wireless networks in my lab and play around with them, um, well, I don't have the time. Um, so building it in simulation is a lot easier and can give me a lot more control over things. So this has been work that my student, Dinesh Krishnaro, has been doing. Uh, he's been building wireless networks and then placing them, putting them through their paces with various kinds of interference situations various kinds of adversarial situations. Maybe one of these nodes is doing something that's damaging to the rest of the network. Uh, so we're trying to understand how does the network work on these conditions. Um, and can, from this information, try to ask, how do we estimate these complexes? For instance, we can listen for certain key packets the network sends around uh, periodically to try to understand what, what the rest of the network looks like. These are called sounding packets, state estimation packets. Some network engineers that have substantial fraction of network wire, ad hoc wireless network traffic is devoted to channel estimation. Nice if we didn't have to. Uh, but in the event, we can pull maybe those sounding packets or maybe some of the other packets. We have a bunch of different ideas that we've been playing around with. But as I said, don't have time to show you that here. Uh, that really dig into what's going on. Now, NS2 doesn't do everything, doesn't model wireless degradation particularly well. Um, and then if we really talk about signal degradation, maybe I'd need something more sophisticated on the free side as well. But, but as it's made, it's worth, worth looking at. Just to get an idea what this might look like. Here's a red network that we built. These are the little boxes that you see down in here. Those boxes are actually packets that are being kicked around in the network. Uh, and then over here, this is a network transcript. So what, we, what we're ingesting into these models now Interesting histories that says now, packet from one location went to another, it was bound for another location, it had this bit error rate, et cetera. Uh, pull these into our into our wireless complex models, and of course that's the topic of future work. So end by once again thanking the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will be happy to take questions. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Let me start then. Uh, okay. Uh, you mentioned doing, there's kind of apply, there's kind of the standard persistent homology calculations that you've taken advantage of. Um, but you also talked about doing stuff with sheaves that maybe the applied topology community doesn't work all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Software for like calculating global sections, for example, or yeah, those kinds of calculations. And good question too. So I'm aware of now two efforts to do this, uh, which uh, Vidit and Rob are have a paper out on computing sheet cohomology. I actually know the maturity of the software there. Uh, I have a, a very tentative, very rough library up on GitHub, which you pull off my website. Uh, 
that does compute sheaf cohomology with, with vector space coefficients. There's a bunch of other things besides sheaf cohomology. It does local sections, uh, does maps between, so sheaf morphisms. Uh, it's working towards trying to compute uh, persistence modules built out of sheaves as well, although that's much more rough. <laughs> Questions? That um, I mean, one thing. So you have this like symbol. So you you can think. So I guess initially we were talking about these sheaves as just kind of set value functors, uh, and then. But an algebraic structure in there, and, and this bottom thing kind of is like a zero object. Uh, yes. So, kind of get into vector spaces, but then you get these mixed. Right. So, so an algebraic structure like maybe a monoid or something that you might want to use instead. That's the direction. I mean, another way to go at this is to try to build a lattice that says, you know, I've got a bunch of different possibilities for how the network might be used because a particular access model is very simplistic. I'm saying either I'm using the channel and no one else can or vice versa. Uh, protocols are actually typically a bit more refined than that. Um, even though it might not be your turn to talk, you may be able to get in a word, ed word in edgewise. Um, and that sort of suggests that I may be able to have uh, some hierarchy of exactly who's using the network, and then some kind of lattice makes a lot more sense there. Great. Any other questions? Uh, and now let's uh, thank Michael again for a great talk. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. All right. You're welcome.